Hello everybody, here we are, we're back. I hope you've had a good few weeks with the infant feeding team at the John Reckon Hospital. I'm Naomi, this is Alex, and we are doing our usual questions and answers. We must be almost at our anniversary, mustn't we now? Um, nearly two years we've been doing this, so we've had the most amazing questions. So this is a session that you can use to uh, put your questions to us and we can answer them live. So um, not too personal, hopefully, but um, if you've got anything really that you're not sure about, you can call us at the end of the, the session or call us at some time. Our details are um, available, I think, at the bottom of the session, aren't they? I'm sure there's somewhere that there on our information yes. is there. And also yeah. you can find us on the website as well, our information. So we've got a really good website, actually, which um, is part of the John Radcliffe um, Hospital. So if you go onto the OUH website and then click on uh, infant feeding um, or maternity or women's services and click on that, then it comes up with a, a, an option that you can then find um, infant feeding or it'll come under breastfeeding. And then uh, you can click on the pages and see resources and you'll see lots of different things that we do. So there's um, times of our clinics, how to contact us and uh, where you can get support from. So there is our clinics, uh, obviously in our number, but there's also local support. So things like Ox um, Oxfordshire Breastfeeding Support and um, the Abingdon Breastfeeding Cafe, uh, La Leche and things like the NCT. So there's links to all of those um, charities that can support you as well as us. Um, and we've also got some um, things like uh, the PDF for Off to the Best Start, which you should all get copies of. You should get one at 36 weeks when you have your scan, if you don't ask for it. Uh, if you don't get it, ask for it, not if you don't ask for it. Um, <laughs> they so, have got stocks, we've just put a new box down there. So, they've so definitely if got you stocks. go for your scan, or you're about to go for your scan, ask for one of these before you leave because it's really useful. You can read about it before you have your baby and then you get a copy of this after you've had your baby as well. So you get two copies. So um, there's no excuse not to know what's going on and what you should do really. And it's, it's a really good read. It's really helpful. It's got nice, things like- Nice pictures. Your nappy, so nappy yeah. change colors and um, how to store your milk, uh, how to hand express and um, all the things that go along with um, why breastfeeding is good for you and for your baby. So that's really, it's a really useful thing to have. And then they've also got local links to other support as well. So um, you should get a copy of that um, when you when you have your scan. So, um, but you can see that online as well. There's a PDF online that you can have. Plus a, another couple of documents. Yeah, there are quite a few. Some of our there. leaflets that we have, like um, antenatal um, harvesting, so colostrum harvesting. And also, um, what else have we got on there? Formula feeding leaflets on there oh, yes. as well. Um, so. The guide to bottle feeding, that's also there. So if you are um, wanting to introduce bottles, that you might find quite helpful uh, to read if you didn't get that one because you were breastfeeding when you left hospital. Cover's changed now, it's a green cover now. Um, it's the, same, the contents are the same, so it's there for you if you are, um, you know, if you're needing to yeah. move onto bottles or if bottle feeding has been your choice. So. And if you are giving formula, we just want to reiterate that, um, you know, the recommendation is that you make one bottle up at a time. And back in the day, we used to say make all the bottles up for the day and people would make it in a jug and pour it into their um, bottles for in, and put it in the fridge for the day but actually that's not recommended anymore and, and we're getting a little bit of feedback from the midwives visiting in the community that that's what the mums are starting to do again that they're making all eight bottles up and putting them in the fridge actually we don't recommend that for safety reasons um, you know bacteria grows and and the longer a bottle is made the more likely it is to grow bacteria in it or be exposed to um, you know infection um, in uh, contamination in the bottle so um, the best practice for your newborn baby is to make one up at a time, boil the kettle, let it cool, um, put the water into um, the bottle and then you put the powder on top of that. And when it. Naomi says let it cool, she means no less than 70 degrees. So it still really needs to be hot. That water needs to be really hot. So yeah. ideally do it sooner rather than later. Yeah. So the recommendation is they talk about putting a freshly drawn litre of water in the kettle and leaving it to stand for no more than 30 minutes. So less than 30 minutes is really important yeah. because if there's a litre of water in the kettle, it won't have dropped below 70 degrees in, in less than half an hour. And the idea of that is that powdered formula has got bacteria in it, it all does, it cannot be helped by the way things are. And as soon as the tin's open, there will be more bacteria. So actually by making it up with water that is really hot, more than 70 degrees, 
then actually you kill the bacteria in the formula which protects your baby. Because one of the things we know is that a baby that is formula fed is five times more likely to be readmitted to hospital with gastrointestinal problems. So, you know, when Naomi's saying about making each bottle at a time, because that limits the risk, it's a real risk. So please, please make them up at a time, make them with really hot water, um, and then you have to cool it down to the right temperature. So, you know, we, we do things and then practice changes, and that's the reason why, is that they found that there are increased risk of infection in, in bottle fed babies, yeah. and the research has shown that, so that's why we changed our practice. Uh, as healthcare professionals and that's why uh, the information you get is, is about that. So if you are, um, if you change over from breast to bottle feeding and you haven't got any input, health visitors aren't around or you've been discharged from your midwife for instance or you've chosen to bottle feed um, at any time, it's, you know, you have to know to do it properly and you can't just go on what your, um, you know, your gran or your aunties told you or what they used to do because it's it's research based and that is the latest research is that the infection risk is greater mm. if you leave them uh, for a longer period of time. So you want your baby to have the best practice and the best available um, uh, feeding that's, that's, uh, that you can do. So that is what we recommend. So, um, you know, if, if your friends are saying that's what they're doing, it isn't the best practice. And, um, you know, the recommendation is that it's one bottle at a time. Absolutely. And yeah. that's safely. So yeah. have we, have, uh, can we still talk or have you got some questions? Um, well, I've, I've got uh, two comments actually. Um, well, no one's a question. Uh, Charlotte's come say hello. She's one of our hello, frequent Charlotte. flyers. So, hello, uh, hello. How are you? <laughs> she's saying hi. Hope you're both well. And Alicia's getting quicker at walking on her own now. Um, she's had her own passport. Wow. So I think we need That's a holiday well. soon. Absolutely. I think you deserve a holiday soon, Charlotte. I know you've been to Devon, but I think, yes, a holiday would be lovely. Um, Katrina, what we haven't done is we haven't said this is an infant feeding talk. Um, so this is, we are predominantly about feeding. We are both midwives. We've both worked in the trust um, and we've worked on deliveries. And you know, Naomi was a community midwife for a very long time. Um, so I will, we will answer your question, but predominantly this is about feeding. So Katrina asks, are unstable lie babies rare? Not that rare. No, quite common. And I think the more babies you have, the more likely mm. it is to happen. It's not going to be not. It's not going to be all the time, but um, you know, as your tummy gets a little bit less toned, shall we say, um, then your baby can move around. And sometimes, you know, if there's a little bit more water in your tummy, then the babies can move about more easily as well. But it isn't uncommon, particularly um, earlier on in the pregnancy. They're all over. But as the pregnancy gets to a bit later. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't like it so much after about 36 weeks, but sometimes babies are quite naughty and they do whiz about all over the place. That's my, my, my second and third, both very naughty. <laughs> you want to put it that way. They would not stay head down, they were all over the place. So, so you just have to be a bit more careful and be a bit on it, you know, mm -hmm. if your waters go or anything like that, and I'm sure you've been told about that. So make sure that um, you do what they tell you and, mm -hmm. you know, take the advice that they give you. Um, back in the old days, you used to be admitted to hospital if your baby was unstable, but now we don't do that because we know that most people have got transport and they can get to hospital easily and they can get support and, and um, you know, babies don't usually come before they're due. Some babies do, but the majority of babies come when they're due, so you know around about when you're going to go into labour and you act, you act on that. So talk it through with your midwife if mm. you have concerns. Um, or ring, um, you know, MA, MAU if you're worried about anything um, when you're, you know, if your baby's not doing what it should be doing. If you've got any questions. And they do actually have Ask the Matron sessions, I think, on a Monday, don't they? They have restarted. They have yeah. restarted doing that. So um, that's totally an appropriate question to ask in those sort of sessions about pregnancy. Or the um, community midwives quite often have sessions as well on questions and answers about being pregnant, what to bring into hospital, water birth labour um, and that sort of thing. And I think they have just done a session on um, labour, early labour and labour. So um, you might want to go into the um, uh, YouTube, OMVP YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and then put in Oxfordshire Maternity Voices Partnership, they've got a, all of the videos that are recorded. So all our live sessions, all the sessions that have been done by all the other practitioners in this trust are on that uh, YouTube channel. And you can look back at some of the things and it might you know, you might find those helpful. Um, there might be a consultant talking. Sometimes we have one of the obstetricians doing some questions and answers, um, and um, also things like visiting and changes in our policies that are going, which is 
constant. Um, you know, there's always a change and we've had another change from today, I think it was, with visiting. So um, the website is also very good at telling you what's happening, the, the um, OUH website, uh, and that tells you about the latest updates on visiting in all departments. So, you know, things like that, it's really helpful to have a look at um, direct to the horse's mouth where the information is so that you can get the most up to date. So the last one was on the 7th of March, it was Wendy Tyler, who's one of our matrons, um, did a session which I can see is on there. Um, and the other thing to mention is that we didn't mention at the beginning of this session is it's actually Safe Asleep Week. So, uh, oh, so yes. that's really valid for us to be talking about because that last week so, you know, we're feeding, actually Safe Asleep is something that we talk about a lot as an infant feeding team because if you think about it, you're going to be feeding at night and so that we, all goes hand in hand and so that very much comes into our remit as the yeah. feeding team to talk about Safe Asleep. All midwives will talk about Safe Asleep. We talk about safer, not safe because we can never eradicate risk, we can minimise risk. So when we talk about safe asleep, um, that's backed up by all the you know, yeah. available resources from Lullaby Trust, which are fabulous, and they've got them here on the OMVP webpage. Um, if you're on the Facebook page, you can see them all there. I'm talking about should you end up, as many parents do, with the baby in your bed, how to minimise the risks in doing that. And so it's things like never having a baby between two adults, having the baby with their own bed covers. So you have your bed covers and they finish on you and then your baby has their own bed covers. That the baby is nowhere near a pillow and the baby is on a flat, firm surface. Um, and that the baby's got something behind them to stop them rolling out should they end up in bed with you. So we know that most people who leave hospital will say, I'm not going to sleep with my baby, but we can tell you now, and there'll be many mums out there now watching this, go, <laughs> going, I said I wouldn't, but I ended up doing yeah. it. And the reason is, by the time you've got to a three, you know, the end of the first week with no sleep, because yeah. your baby wants to be right next to you, then actually many parents will cave and they will do it. So it is minimising the risk. Know what you're doing, how yeah. to minimise the risks before you do it. So unfortunately, the most unsafe place to do it is on a sofa or a chair. So if you fall asleep, if you're taking your baby downstairs and sitting in a chair or li lying on a sofa and you're likely to fall asleep, that is more unsafe than taking all the sort of precautions in your bed in a side lying position. So please, you know, have a look at the safer sleep information. I don't know if we've got it here with us. Oh, um, yeah. But it is yeah. it is fabulous. There are fabulous resources on the Lullaby Trust. There's a link to it from the QR code on the front of your um, postnatal care plan. I've not so, noticed that, but there's so. one just at the corner there and that links to everything. I think the other thing to say is if you're excessively tired or if you've had any alcohol or your partner's in bed with you, they've had um, alcohol or um, any medication or drugs and or they smoke or you smoke you shouldn't have your baby in bed with absolutely you. Uh, it's absolutely uh, you know not recommended that that um, you put your baby at risk with any of those things so if you feel that you're excessively tired which is the irony when you have a baby is you are excessively tired but if you're you know you don't feel safe then your baby should not be in bed with you um, so uh, just think about all the situations that you're that um, that are going on around you, and um, you know, make that informed decision yourself about how safe your baby will be if you do have your baby in bed with you. I think it's important that you know about these rather than saying you must not do it. Yes, absolutely. Because actually, the reality is that you're exhausted, and that's the only way you're going to get sleep is if you have your baby with you feeding. But there are so many risks that can go with that, and and it's understanding those and making sure that we minimise that risk. There's also Helen Ball, isn't there? What's that? Yeah. I can't remember what Basis. their app's called. Basis. Basis, that's it. Um, it. And it's a really good app, and she has done a lot, a lot of the research for more than 30 years now um, from Durham University, and she does uh, mother and baby sleep um, filming. So she has a um, you know, studio that she uses, and she um, a, a lab, and mums and babies sleep, and she does um, research on them and films them and watches behaviour. She's an anthropologist and she watches how uh, babies interact and mothers interact with their babies and that's where they've come up with um, the guidelines for lullaby and they've worked together with a lot of yeah. other um, professionals to come up with the safest options for mothers and babies and partners when you are having um, 
problems uh, feeding, sleeping, newborn babies um, in the early days because it is absolutely, um, you know, to the to the word written um, that this is what you must not do because that's the that's the research that they've come up with is that these are the most unsafe things that we've gone through already. So BASIS stands for the Baby Sleep Information Source. So they've got a lot of information on there for parents and for health professionals. And I said the Lullaby Trust is a superb organisation with a lot of information on it. And it, it does have our co-sleeping advice section and then when not to co-sleep. And just as Naomi has said, the top one is smoking. So either of you smoking, the baby should not never be in bed with you. Um, if our, if our, your partner has been drinking or on medications, as Naomi said, if the baby is premature, again, another reason we do not recommend babies that have been born prematurely to be in bed with mums and dads. Or if the baby is of low birth weight, so less than 2.5 kilograms which is five pounds five and a half pounds and they quite categorically say here what i've already said about never sleep on a sofa or a chair with your baby is this in fact they stated this can increase the risk of sudden infant death by 50 times that's how dangerous it oh, is nice. um so you know minimizing the risk is all we can do um, we know that what we always say as a trust is the safest ba place for your baby to sleep is in a cot in your room um, with you there, um, and that, but if you sh you know should you end up with your baby in bed, which we know many many parents do, and around the world it is very normal practice. It's how to minimise the risks and be aware of it. And we actually have a higher um, infant um, so you know SIDS uh, problem in in the Western culture than in um, other cultures, and we don't know what it is, whether um, it's the bedding that we use or the lifestyle that we have. Um, the diet that we eat, you know, the, the, the risk is much greater in the Western world than in other countries where families co-sleep with all of their children um, as a norm and often they're just on maximal floors and things like that. So we don't know what the, what the trigger for that risk factor, other than the fact that all the things that we've already said. But, you know, unfortunately, even when you do those things, sometimes uh, they still, you do have sudden infant death occur, even when everyone's being very careful. And when you have your baby beside you, and you're asleep and your baby's asleep, you, you sort of um, reciprocally hear your baby's breathing mm. and you're semi-conscious, you know, and we know that as a mother, you sleep with one eye open all the time, you, you don't get a really good sleep for a long time. You're tuned in to your baby. You're very it? tuned in yeah. to your baby, it's real attunement. And your baby can hear you breathing. And so when we know when you um, give breast milk, uh, they digest it slightly differently. They're in a slightly lighter sleep than babies that do get formula as well. So if, you, you know, if you're bottle feeding your baby, they tend to, to be much more deeply asleep because they have much larger volumes usually and feed less often. And so they don't, you know, so that's one of the risks that we talk about is that, you know, breastfeeding is at the top of the table and then it, 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 it goes down. But, um, you know, all the safe practices providing you what, do all of those guidelines, but we know that babies that are breastfed away can feed more frequently, so they're much lighter sleepers and yeah. they can then hear their parents sleeping and um, the parents can he hear them sleeping and they wake up more frequently and that's why they feed more frequently. And if you've got them close to you in that first um, you know, months of having them, then um, you're much more likely to respond to them and they're much more likely to respond to you. And that's part of the research that they found. And it's that breastfed mums, you already mentioned, are, are likely to have 45 minutes more sleep at night. Yes, so, I didn't say that. No, there you go. That's what the so research said. I know said. people think that if you move to bottles that you'll get more sleep, that isn't necessarily the case. Research is to get up and make them and yeah. sort them out and wind yeah. them. And and you've got all those things. hormones to help you go back to sleep as well when you're yeah. breastfeeding. You're releasing all those lovely hormones that help you just yeah. go back to sleep. My husband thought that was a perfect excuse when he was told that in antenatal. He thought that was a perfect excuse for him never to have to get up and help me. So, uh, water. So it went on. <laughs> anyway, we've got a few more questions. So um, let's have a quick look at those and we can come back to things. Charlotte has put up that her Polish pen friend just had a C-section, a baby girl. That's very lovely. Congratulations to your pen friend, Charlotte. All that experience you've got now, Charlotte, that you can share with her and help yeah. her. It's all about peer support, isn't it? Um, Sarah has said, afternoon, due my second baby in two weeks, very exciting times it is. This time around I'm under medical advice and is my preference to comb combination feed, breastfeeding and formula. Long story, but long history of mastitis with first child who I, who, can I, 
seek support from once I'm in um, for formula feeding advice. I know there's a lot of breastfeeding advice, which I'm so grateful for. If I can um, want to aim to do breast only for the first week for colostrum, then introduce com uh, combination feeding after one week. Well, we are the infant feeding team, yep. and that's because we support mothers with whatever way they're feeding. So we would be there to support you um, regardless of how you choose to feed. So, yeah, we all will be. But you know, if you need more, um, more support than the staff are in a position to offer, it's still us because we're the infant feeding team. But staff are all trained on helping with breastfeeding and formula feeding. Make sure they show you how to do paste feeding when you're in the hospital. Yeah. Ask them to show you about paste feeding, which means that you um, offer a baby. And I think I've got a bottle of tea to you. I'm not sure if I have there. Um, we always think we have everything in that box. We have a box and we have it. And we take it out for some reason and we've never got everything. Find it hidden somewhere else. Okay. I've got a secret. You've got the doll though. I've got your bottle and I have. So we can talk about paste feeding yeah. now if you want. Why and not? then you can see that. So. Um, so if you've got your baby close to you, and, and uh, particularly if you're doing um, combination feeding, your baby um, will be breastfeeding and having bottles, then um, you know you want your baby close and, and you want to have that closeness and relationship building with your baby. We know that having that closeness and looking at your baby, then looking at you, helps to grow your baby's brain. It's, you know, it's part of their development. It's really important that you have that um, closeness to, to make that relationship. Um, and then, um, you hold the bottle on its side slightly so um, obviously if it's nearly empty it goes up but um, you make sure that there's enough food in the teat here uh, you don't need to fill the whole teat up like we used to say and if you actually turn a bottle up like that it just drip 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 if you put it like that it doesn't so then um, as your baby's close then you um, rub the teat down the baby's top lip and let the baby take uh, the bottle into its mouth and then they will suckle and pause suckle and pause suckle and pause as a breastfed baby would and then when they've had enough they will spit it out so obviously you t as I said you tip it up as the bottle empties um, because uh, obviously you want to get the milk out of it that way to maximize but to start with you do it um, paste and babies will take the food that they want rather than the food you want to give them because if you keep putting it in their mouth they will keep sucking it and often they will do it and then they'll bring everything up because they've had too much and they will often gag if they're really full because they're so you know they're really having a lot and, and also you can see if you do it too fast their eyebrows are going up and they're really struggling to suck swallow and breathe because they can't do that uh, all in one go as babies now if you are going to be trying to get onto the bottle and you're supplementing your baby for whatever reason um, it's medically indicated or you've chosen to do that then you want to keep breastfeeding then make sure that you offer your bottle on both sides so that your baby gets used to feeding in both directions and then you would um, tip the baby's uh, top lip because that will make them open their mouth and put their tongue out and um, just the same as if you were running the nipple down the top lip it's the same just to elicit that gape and make them open their mouth and take the food in that they want to have and they will tell you when they haven't had enough so um, you know that's paste feeding it means that they're not stressed it means that they're enjoying their feed they're having a positive oral experience and they're able to take what they want and not be overfed. And when we started teaching this, it was a few years ago now, when it sort of came uh, as, as mainstream, uh, you know, we were teaching midwives and mums to do it. Um, we found that babies that came to clinic were being overfed. They were very unsettled and they were getting large amounts of food because we were just tipping it in. And uh, when they started doing paste feeding, they came back and said, well, actually, my baby's only taking about 30 mils less now, it, and it's much happier because it's not overfed. So actually, you know, it's, it's really important that they can take what they want and, you know, they, they will learn then to um, balance what they get to eat and they won't overfeed. And then if you've got a baby that doesn't overfeed, you're going to have a, child, a toddler that doesn't overeat and a child that doesn't overeat and an adult that doesn't overeat. So, you know, you're limiting overriding the feeding cues which are so important for learning about um, you know feeding as you get older and taking food so um, it's really important that you don't overfeed babies because of that so that they have the opportunity to learn when they've had enough and decide when they want more or if they've had enough so that's what this is all about have you got anything else to add to that no no that was great i did a bit of research while you were chatting as well though because i had a look at the next question from our lovely Vic. 
Um, so I was just doing a bit of research into that. Over. Right, it's been so much easier. There's two of us doing these sessions. Let's <laughs> get the opportunity to do. I can. I can. We feel the cracks. <laughs> yeah, and I can look at other things for the next question. So, um, anyway, Sarah came back a moment ago already, and she's already said thank you. <laughs> she said, um, "Thank you for the pace feeding tip. We'll watch a video or two with my husband." Did you say that we've done our videos? Did you mention that? Uh, only briefly when we talked about our website, but um, the OUH website, the Infant Feeding, if you go on there, there are video yeah. resources on there. We've done seven videos in our wondrous um, acting skills. <laughs> no, no masters, <laughs> no Oscars. We're far more natural on Facebook Live natural, than on Natural, we look like rabbits in the headlamps. <laughs> as soon as the camera's put in front of us. Oh, yeah. we, don't, we don't think we're in front of a camera now. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've got videos on pace feeding there and um, all sorts of different things. So, you know, How to Hand Express, there's a real life one, uh, you know, Mum on one of the wards that yeah. um, Alex videoed. It's fantastic. You can see how they hold the syringe and they do everything on that. And also how to use a breast pump, um, relationship building, so about growing the baby's brain, which is yeah. really, really important Absolutely. that you understand because it's yeah. kind of a thing that you don't associate with feed. And, and having breastfeeding, but actually it's so important in your baby's development that, you know, a happy baby, a good, um, with a good relationship, so you have this attunement with you and, and your baby, um, that they grow into happy children and adults and they learn to develop relationships themselves because they feel secure and, um, you know, all of those things are part of relationship building, that they learn to to develop their relationships as they get older and it's that security that they need. It's that trust isn't it, so yeah. learning to trust that you'll meet their needs, it's yeah. this whole thing about breaking that idea in the UK culture that I think still perpetuates that we spoil babies, yeah. we'll make a rod for him, but we don't. Yeah. You actually have a happier, more confident child if you meet their needs from the day, from day one onwards. And sometimes you'll go round and round and you'll have a baby that's crying um, and you can't work it out what's the matter, you know, you've tried feeding, you've changed the nappy, you've given them a cuddle, you've done all those things and you'll just have to start again. Sometimes, you know, they don't it's know why they Yeah, sometimes, but it's just keeping them close, meeting their needs, and that's the best thing you can be doing, and just reinforcing to them that, that you are, you know, doing that. And they found that babies that are responded to um, early on and through this first year or so yeah. um, are the babies that are more confident, will cry less going forward. So there is your, you're sowing what you will reap later. You are laying great foundations down when you meet the baby. But also the other thing to say is responsiveness we forget to mention um, is it's there for you too. You know, if you're, if it's your first day at home and you know, it's in first day at home and your partner's at work, you know, maybe you're feeling a bit low, a bit blue. Actually, putting your baby to the breast releases oxytocin in both you and your baby. And oxytocin is a feel-good hormone. It'll give you a lift, make you feel better. You know, if you think, mm, I'm mm -hmm. feeling a bit full, I could go and pump. Well, maybe offer the baby the breast instead. Don't go to the pump. Get the baby on, even if they are a bit sleepy. And, you know, if you've got low supply and you're carrying your baby all day, so invest in a sling, you will increase your milk production. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. one of the things that Keep we know. Close stimulates your hormones to make yeah. more milk so the closer your baby is the more frequently you know so invest in a good sling because um, that will be your lifesaver it gives you two hands to use uh, with your baby attached to you which uh, you know is where they expect to be yeah, you know, yeah that's where mammals expect to be for a long time yeah and uh, I think our culture is put your baby down expect to sleep for four hours so that you you know you can carry on with your day and then um, you know they'll wake up and feed well they might do that once <laughs> And then, you know, you're just, all you're doing is feeding and playing with your baby and they get to two weeks old and you have to entertain them. And then they get to four weeks old and you have to entertain them and you have to do things. And it's really difficult to fit in anything else in your day. So the sling meets their needs for closest and comfort. Yeah. So it's a box of sling libraries, very good place yeah, to try. Then I don't know what they'll say, if I, they, I'm saying it to everybody, but <laughs> yeah, they are, they are fabulous, box of sling library. You know, and they will. The, the wonderful thing about the sling library is they will suit a, swing, a sling to you. And we've got colleagues who've got you know three and four slings for different you know different functions, things. different things, yeah. different ways of carrying the baby. And actually, people who get really proficient at using slings, really comfortable wearing, you know, doing the whole baby wearing, which is wonderful. And um, they they'll have the baby on the front for a lot of the time. And if they need to do something that they can't really have the baby in the front, they put them on the back. Yeah. And you know, as they get a bit tighter, as they get older, they love being there. You know, we see that in other 
cultures and it's something that is really liberating in our culture too yeah. so, and, and very normal i think it's not abnormal to have your baby on you all the time no. which you know family members will often say and if it's of an older generation they will be the ones that say don't you think you should put your baby down but actually you know you're making a very secure baby yeah um, emotionally um, as well to to manage everyday life and to deal with everyday problems once they grow up mm. and that's really really important right we're going to go on a completely different tangent oh. it goes back to what we were chatting about earlier Vic has asked our lovely Vic um, hello lovely feeding team hello lovely Vic um, do prep we miss you yeah <laughs> do the um, perfect prep machines heat the water to the high enough um, temperature for formula sterilisation. Well, that was on our list today, wasn't it, <laughs> to talk about? <laughs> well, it's interesting, so actually, I've had a quick peek. I've gone on to First Steps Nutrition. So anybody out there who is um, thinking about formula feeding or maybe on the verge of formula feeding for many reasons, including Sarah, have a look at First Steps Nutrition. They have fantastic resources. It's, it's evidence-based, non-biased information. Information, again, for mothers and parents and also health professionals um, and actually in their report um, the it's called the bacterial contamination of powdered infant formula on page 38 i think it is 37 and 38 Vic, um, Vic, it talks a lot about it and, and i think the research is still not out there so what the what um helen crawley has written here it, she's um, in the first steps nutrition yeah. um, is that there is has been research done into the perfect prep machine but by the manufacturers Tommy Tippy and it's not been released but what's very interesting at the moment is that um, Amy Brown uh, Professor Amy Brown from Swansea University has done a lot of work in the infant feeding world and she's actually launched I think it was this week or last week some research into formula preparation um, into how parents are, are preparing their formula so it, it may very well be that we get some more um, non-biased evidence-based information yeah. coming forward in the future and if anybody is watching this and is actually making up formula and formula feeding their baby then you might like to be part of it and I do believe you get some vouchers for being part of it too as well so if you were to look up Dr Amy Brown Swansea University um, you may be able yeah. to sign up to her research um, and those of you that don't know what a prep machine is it's, it's a yes. machine that um, is ready uh, can prepare the food so you get uh, you have your powder you get a hot shot of um, hot water tiny tiny shot of it and then it puts the uh, cold water into it and it makes um, the, the perfect uh, temperature bottle ready made and, and it makes the smallest volume you can have is 120 mils so that's four ounces so um, it, it's quite expensive if you've got a newborn baby and you're feeding because actually you're wasting half the feeds mostly in the early days so um, there's quite a lot of waste when you do it, but um, also, you know, there's, a, there's questions, and I think that's what Vic's um, talking about, is that that shot that you get, is it hot enough to kill the bacteria, and is there enough hot water to kill the bacteria, and, and that's what the research is probably so the looking at. the Food Standards Agency in 2014 wrote a statement about it, and they, they question whether it is, there is enough of the hot water yeah. to kill the bacteria, so they, you know, it is, it is still, um, a discussion point, I would say, as to whether it is um, it is safe. I mean, obviously, there are a lot of people are using them. Too. Yeah, a lot of people are using them. Um, anyway, so I think this is a this is an ongoing work in progress, to mm -hmm. be honest, as to whether they are considered safe or not. So watch this space. Um, I'm sure that some research will come out soon. Right, thanks for that Vic, that was a very topical yeah, question, great. brilliant. Charlotte has said, is there a specific age that you can put your toddler into a toddler bed, as I'm not sure whether to get one yet. Alicia moves a lot in her sleep. Now, I think there's no hurry personally, no hurry to get them in a toddler bed. You'll end up picking her up off the floor, left, right and centre and putting her back in it if she's anything That's like other choice. children. It's when you're ready. Yeah. So, and when she's ready, but I, you know, I think it very, with the first baby, you're ready to move on to those next stages, you're aren't you? All the time. But when you get to a, any other children, you're quite happy to keep them a baby a lot longer because you know that that time will pass very quickly. So if she's happy and you're happy with her in a toddler bed. I mean, in, in a normal cot, then I'd leave her there personally. But. Until they grow out of it. Yeah. <laughs> they can't stretch their legs out. <laughs> Heber has said, Good afternoon, ladies. Do you think probiotic drops for babies are worth using? My baby's exclusively breastfed. I got some as a present and not sure whether I should use them. Well, that's what breast milk is already. 
full yeah. of it. Full, full of, of it. Probiotics. You don't need anything additional. So your breast milk is a to the best probiotic ever. I think any other probiotic that you might have is trying to copy what you've got in breast milk. So and it's very specific um, probiotic, isn't it? Yeah. In breast milk, which um, you know the probiotics may not have. Although I think probiotic drops for babies will tell you it's the one that their babies should have. But you've already got it in breast milk. Yeah. So and I think some formulas putting probiotics in, aren't they? I think they've advertised yeah. that they're putting them in because they realise that it's already in breast milk. Um, but you can't, you know, they can claim that they're putting them in, but they can't necessarily put the right ones in for your baby mm. and in a format that your baby can maximise on them. So, you know, this is the problem with it, that our milk is so Unique. clever yeah. um, that actually everything that's in it is bioavailable. So the body is made, made. Yeah, the baby, whereas, you know, iron is something that comes up for a lot of discussion um, when it comes to breast milk and formula milk. Um, in, I, in the breast milk, and the constituents of iron are really low, but breast milk also has lactoferrin, exactly. Yeah. And that allows the, the little bit of iron that is in breast milk to be perfectly and utterly utilized. Whereas in order to have enough for the baby to absorb sufficient from formula milk, they have to add a lot. So, because it's not so bioavailable. So there's big differences. So, so actually the baby poo that you your baby has when it has is exclusively formula fed, it's quite pasty. Yeah. And a lot of that pastiness is from the iron that the baby's excreting. So um, they have to excrete an awful lot of it because they can't absorb. So it's got large amounts of iron in it, but they have to. They can't absorb that much of it. And most of it is excreted again. And so that's the, the poo is more pasty because of that. Uh, and so that's why baby poo that's uh, from formula fed, exclusively form of formula fed baby is different to a breastfed baby because of the and baby having to excrete a lot of the things that they can't absorb themselves. So yes, mm. um, you know, I would say if you have had lots of antibiotics, then you could think about some probiotics for yourself that, that are breastfeeding friendly. So not all probiotics are suitable for breastfeeding mothers. So you can look up and see if you, if, you know, if you feel that you've had a lot of antibiotic treatment or something, or your diet is very poor, um, improve your diet with lots of things that are probiotic friendly, so live yogurts and um, you know um, sauerkraut -y type things, uh, so that um, you can create your own healthy gut, um, and then your baby will get um, optimal health from you, uh, and it will be tailor made from you for your baby, which is part of your genetic makeup. So um, I think it, the answer is that your baby doesn't really need a probiotic. Yeah you're already doing it yeah they're okay. getting lots yeah <laughs> um i've got a, a question from hannah um it's not quite what we're we doing with deal with normally because it is um it's not to do with feeding and it's really very sad so hannah hannah had a stillborn baby in october at 33 weeks um and her umbilical cord came out first um and her she had wasn't dilating it was all before she went into labor um, she was wondering if it could happen again, or was it due to the problem that a baby had, which she had polycystic kidney disease. So I, it sounds like quite a rare occurrence. Uh, this isn't normal. Not this unusual. happens. It's unusual. Yeah. So the best people to talk to about this will be your midwives. Um, you, you know, having lost a baby, you're going to be under the fantastic Rainbow Clinic. Um, one, our, one of our colleagues. Paula, um, it's Paula, Candice and Laura now, um, and they're wonderful. They will be the ones who will be able to answer those sort of questions. Um, they spend a lot of time talking through everything with you. Yeah, and it's that totally their area of expertise and talk about, you know, what happened last time and talking about, you know, so trying to help you because any pregnancy going forward is obviously going to be, you're going to be very anxious and that's completely normal. Um, and they will be there to support you through that. That's why we have a, you know, a team specifically for this and it's known as the rainbow clinic so hannah i'm um, sad to hear that yeah really sad yeah so and we're thinking of you and i think yeah. it happens much more than people realize you know we, we you know sadly there are you know quite it does these things do happen to people but um but because it's happened to you the once does not necessarily mean it would happen to you a second time and you'll be very well looked after yeah so look out for paula Candice and, um, and Laura, they're a lovely, lovely team. So. 
Um, right, it came back and said thank you. Uh, Hannah has said, oh, Hannah has said, yes, Candice is the lovely lady who was there with me and my daughter. I didn't realise she could help. That's amazing, thank you. Yes, they're there. They're there not just for when you lose your baby. Before, they're during there, and after. Yeah, exactly. They're there to support you when you go on to have another baby because they totally understand where you've been and what's happened to you in the past. So, yeah, Candice is very special. In fact, she's in the office next door, so we shall tell her that you said that. So. Right, we've run out of questions. Oh, have we now? Um, I'm trying to think what else we were going to talk about today. Well, we did a bit about Safer Sleep, which is great because it's yeah. Safer Sleep Week, so that was really good to talk, bring that up. We talked a bit about responsiveness and relationship building because that's always really important. Oh, I know what we were going to mention. We were talking about hand expressing, and um, I think the thing, the most important thing, um, you know, when you've had your baby is that you know how to get milk from your breasts in the early days. Oh, yes. I think that's very... Um, you know, your baby is, is very busy in those early days and um, the expectation for you is that, you know, you have a bit of rest, but it, it doesn't happen very often. And I think certainly on the second night when you have your baby, you um, your baby is very busy and it, <laughs> it, it does grow horns. We talk about this endlessly on this session, I was, don't we? I will, I will pass, <laughs> sorry to interrupt you, Naomi, but I will <laughs> walk past the uh, NIPE clinics, the NIPE clinics where your baby has their check, you know, before you go home from the hospital if you're in. Um, and there was a mum sitting outside and um, waiting to go in for her check. This is the, it's the newborn um, check. And the baby was just gorgeous and asleep in the cot. I went, oh, look at your gorgeous sleeping baby. And she went, it wasn't like that last night. <laughs> and I said, oh, but that's normal. That's really yeah. normal. At night, they grow horns. And during the day, they're angels. <laughs> they yeah. um, and she said, oh, I didn't know that. I said, it's true. It's absolutely normal. And her partner was with her. And I said, right, go and give your baby a cuddle and let your partner have some sleep now because tonight your baby will be awake again yeah. and that is really normal and I think we need to keep reiterating yeah. this that it's normal for babies to be awake at night and asleep in the day. It's, it's got something to do with your hormones you know they're, they're, mm. you know, the, the way that the body has and the um, circadian clock. Or if you believe Sue Richards, um, he was Sue Richards, this lovely, lovely lactation consultant who runs the Abingdon Breastfeeding Cafe, and she always used to say to mums, well, in the cave-dwelling days, that's when it was safe to be awake, because yeah. you didn't want a crying baby awake when you were out Running hunting gathering, dinosaurs. you know, because you, you'd have something after you if this baby was awake and wanting to feed. So she believes that from the from our cave-dwelling days, our Probably. babies learnt to be awake at night when it was safest to be fed, rather than during the day when that would put the whole family at risk so uh, so that's another way of looking at it but it is really really normal and it should happen yeah you should be feeding your baby endlessly in the first three days you know they're chasing milk and the first day they're often very sleepy and they may not have uh, more than three feeds in that time and that's also normal but it, your baby may come out and just plug in and not stop that's also normal um, but what what you do need to know is that they are chasing the milk they are making you make the milk so that you are ready when the milk is ready to come in. Now, babies shouldn't be receiving large volumes until that milk comes in. That is that is nature's way. You know, the breasts are not full when your baby is born. The reason being that they have to have small amounts. The colostrum is a laxative, and it gets rid of all the uh, meconium. It clears the tummy. It clears all the gunk from the birth, and then your baby is ready to receive milk. It lines the baby's gut and protects it from all the. Um, pathogens which can be exposing your baby when they come out of the uterus and they're no longer sterile. Uh, it, it you know stops the baby from, from developing allergies and viruses and things like that when when um, they come out so that they're protected and they start to build up their immunity but it also protects them, the colostrum protects them from developing allergies to other foods and um, from things like asthma and eczema and all of those uh, things familial so it might be that celiac disease or um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease and things like that it protects your baby so the baby is meant to get tiny amounts that line their gut until they're ready to receive milk when it's been lined and that is it on day three so you have got to learn to manage that and know that um, your baby um, is is chasing the milk and wanting to be fed frequently but it, the reason they're doing that is that it's not about the food for them in the early days because it's tiny drops and we talk about volumes on syringes don't we and how small the amounts they are on these tiny little syringes so it's not about the food they're not getting bottles they're getting tiny little bits which um, drips in um, it's about adapting to being outside of the womb 
and to um, uh, stimulate you. So it's about the stimulation. So if your baby is not feeding frequently, we all say stimulate your own breast by doing some hand expressing. So you're doing the hand expressing if your baby's sleeping a lot. And so it's really important that you're taught how to do hand expressing, how to be able to get milk out of your breast, because this is your sort of emergency care when you go mm -hmm. home, when your baby's not attaching to the breast, you're learning to breastfeed, it's a new skill. Neither of you know what you're doing, it takes time. And so in order to make sure that you get food, you need to be able to do this uh, in order to give your baby that food so that you know how to get milk out of your breast. So it's so crucial that your carer in the hospital shows you how to do it before you go. And if your carer is saying, well, we can give you some extra food, but she's not teaching you how to do hand expressing, you need to say, I need to know how to hand express, please, can you show me? So that you're doing it properly and you can get food out because if you're getting food given to your baby in the hospital because um, you, you know your baby's crying and it's hungry and you think that there's not enough. You're not learning how to do it at home when you go home and there's not extra food to give your baby other than formula. And you're not stimulating your breast. And you're not style. stimulating your breast to make the milk when your baby really needs it on day three. And so the more stimulations you do in those early days, and particularly if your baby's not attaching, you need to know how to hand express. It's so important that you know how to do that skill. Now, you know, if you get home and nobody's actually shown you or you've gone home from the labour ward or you've, you know, you've had a home birth and, and you haven't had that opportunity, we have got the video on our website. Yeah. There's, there's um, lots of information in Off to the Best Start. So the book that we showed you earlier, yeah. this one. Yeah. The information is on there, how to do it. There's YouTube videos that you can learn how to hand express on. Obviously, you're not going to be able to read it because it's going to be back to front, but it's pages, as well. pages 14 and 15. And you, you know, you really need to know that it's probably the most important thing that you need to be able to do because if your breasts are very full, you can get milk out. If your baby's needing food and can't attach, you need to get food out. So it's really important that you ask somebody how to do it. Um, they may think somebody else has done it. The staff, have, it's been absolutely mad on the wards in the last few days. Um, and those of you that may have just gone home and are watching will back that up. It's been really, really, really busy. And, um, you know, everybody is chasing their tail at the moment and, and there's very little time for anybody. It's really hard work for mums because they don't feel that they're getting the support and it's really hard for the midwives because they know that they're not giving you as much time as they really could. So if you're finding that you're not being shown how to do things, be proactive and make sure you find out how to do it with the information you're given and ask for help if you're struggling because it's, you know, the community midwives can then show you how to hand express as well. There's a leaflet on um, antenatal harvesting as well, which has got a very good, so if you've had that given to you by your midwives and you've learned how to do it, then you've got that skill before you have your baby. And that in itself is really useful because when you then have your baby, you're not learning a new skill. You don't have to have done it and collected colostrum and frozen it, but you can learn that skill and have that um, dexterity that you've got to learn about when you have your baby. Brilliant. Anything else to say on that one? No. Do you want to just go through hand expressing? Yeah, absolutely. We have got a few more questions. So, so um, it's really important that you tap into your breast correctly because a lot of people say they can't ever get anything out and actually um, they're not doing it quite as well as they could. It's a very specific skill. So um, we suggest that you uh, make a C, C shape with your um, pincer finger and your thumb and uh, so that your um, it is literally like a C. It's not like that, because that's not a C, it's like that, that's a C. And you um, go to the base of your nipple and you go about two to three centimeters behind the base of your nipple. And with that C shape, you push back and you put your thumb and your pin, um, pointy finger together. So you're imagining that you're doing that on your breast and you're going in, so not that. You don't want to be doing that because that's rubbing and it doesn't tap into those ducts. So I'm not doing that, I'm doing that action, which is really different. And that's very, very specific. And if you don't quite get that right, then you don't often get the colostrum that you're looking for. But if you get that pincer action, if you imagine that your fingers are going together on your breast tissue, visualize that and then push back slightly and then hold and squeeze for about um, three to four seconds, something like that. Just count Nice it. long time. Gin and tonic, gin and tonic. 
uh, and uh, hold and squeeze and then keep going in that spot just keep going yeah. you might find just a massaging the breast slightly before you do it will help to encourage a letdown or having your baby nearby looking at your, your baby, baby sniffing their head that all helps get oxytocin if you flowing. haven't had your baby then imagine you know visualize yeah. things that make you feel really happy so if you've got a pet you know you can do some pet stroking and cuddling um, and uh, think about things that make you feel happy. So a nice event that you've been to, or a nice day, a wedding day, or a nice holiday somewhere, and um, visualize that because oxytocin is very, very shy. And so the more stressed you are, and the more worried you are about something, the less likely you are to let that oxytocin in to make it work. And, uh, and then you don't get anything out. And that goes to, in hospital as well, if you're very, feeling very observed and you're very stressed because your baby's crying, you're not going to let that oxytocin work to its maximum and that will stop you from producing um, and getting as much colostrum out. So, you know, it's all about letting go and being really relaxed and, um, you know, those lovely thoughts that you need in order to um, let that flow of colostrum come. So you, you work on one area and then um, if you're not getting anything at all, or you, it's slowed down, then move around like a clock face and you go all the way around your breast uh, and then um, you would go to the other side and do the same again and then you can go back to this side and do that because that will have started the flow again and once you've stimulated that a little bit the flow will come and then you go back to the other side again. So do two rounds because then you will start to get that flow coming and it will make a difference. So um, have a go, if you're pregnant, have a go, because, uh, you know, it's really seven helpful. weeks onwards, please, not before. Yes, not, not before, no, we don't want that. <laughs> don't do it before seven. Um, but also, you know, if you are coming up to that time, get some syringes from your midwife and, um, you know, learn how to hold them, because that, one of these, to use one of these is, is a skill in itself, and a lot of people find that difficult. You can just collect it in a little pot if you prefer, but um, you know, some mums do it that way around and they use it with their finger and thumb that way around. So you can move it around and pull, pull it up that way. So you'd hand express or you can get um, somebody to help you, but you can hold it and pull it like that. And actually the video shows that, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, she does, yeah, got. she's very clever. Uh, and it shows you how to use it because that is a really difficult skill. If you're getting lots of milk, then um, you know you can do it straight into a bottle. Lots of colostrum, you can do it straight into a bottle, or if you've got lots of milk. Now, some mums don't respond to pumps, and they respond really well to hand expressing. So um, you know it might be that um, pumping is not for you, and hand expressing works better and it's more efficient. Some people can't hand express and they have to use pumps. So yeah. you know you don't know till you get there what's going to work for you and what your um, skills are like and how dexterous you are. We uh, don't tend to use a pump until the milk starts to come in. Yeah. And that links to a question we've got coming on in a minute, actually. So, okay. you know, when the milk's coming in, that's when you do it. When you're dealing with costume with such small amounts, we would lose it in the pump kits. Yeah. Right, we have we got... Have some questions. We've got um, Leanne. So Leanne has written, hi ladies, hope you're both well. It's Lyra's first birthday, two Never. weeks today. Yeah, no. wow. And I'm, I'll be back to work. Lyra's eating three meals a day and she's still breastfeeding throughout the day wow. too. She's also grown to be between the second and the ninth centile and not something I never thought she'd do. She's really grown. Um, will it be enough if I pump once a day when I go back to work so she can have one bottle a day? I really don't want our breastfeeding journey to end just because I'm going back to work. I love breastfeeding her and I want to carry on for as long as she wants. Will she just catch up in the evenings and night time when I'm home from work? She will, she will. And, you know, if you're not working full time, so you're not doing five days a week, um, it, you know, it's almost easier as well because um, you'll catch up on the days that you're not working. Um, so it is stressful thinking about it, isn't it? But it will work out and it's really good for you both to have time out from each other. <laughs> from the point of view of the pumping, I think you're gonna to have to be guided by your breasts. Yeah. So, you know, if she's been feeding throughout the day, once might not be enough initially. You might find you have to pump a little bit more frequently than that initially. Um, so you're just gonna to have to go with how it feels with, to begin with. Um, and you might have to go and do two quick pumps maybe rather than one big one. Um, so just see how it goes. Um, and obviously, you know, your employer is expected to provide you with a lockable room and a fridge to put things in so Private, and it yeah. should not be the toilet you have a right to a lockable room and a fridge um, and it should not be a toilet so. and you know obviously when you're going to work and you've been used to feeding your baby you might find that your breasts are quite full when you when you do that yeah it 
it gradually settles down yeah. and I think from about nine or ten months your breasts don't get quite so full often um, once your baby starts to eat um, you know solid foods as well that they, they you know we say food before one is for fun yeah um, so they always have a breastfeed before a meal anyway but actually um, you will you might find that your milk production changes slightly when mm. when they do go back to work and then they get really lots of milk mm. or they feed all night work to catch up and they haven't done that yeah. and then you're really full in the mornings when you go to work. I was so. just about to say that Lyra is likely to be quite a bit more. She might want to be checking in that you're still there yeah. as she gets yeah. used to it. It will settle down in time, yeah. but there's no reason why you would have to do anything other than carry on breastfeeding her. It's it? lovely. You'll love it. Fantastic. A whole year, can't imagine it. It's a year since we met you. Amazing. Charlotte has said, can we all pray for Ukraine? And I have to say, I think uh, as a midwife, and I'm sure Naomi was the same last week when the maternity unit was hit, that was tough. That was, you know, it's all been awful. It's been really sad to see what's been going on. But when you see a unit like our own being hit, yeah. and um, some of the news that's come out of that has been extremely sad. Um, yes, we so yes, absolutely, absolutely, very much in our thoughts. Sarah has just come back. Just to clarify, in terms of colostrum, I said this LinkedIn. How many days does this come out for before the normal milk comes in? I wasn't quite so sure, so I was thinking to introduce formula after one week. But if I could do it a tad sooner, I'd like to like to recombine combination feeding. So normally your colostrum is well, colostrum doesn't go away completely to begin with anyway. But what happens is that you're producing colostrum um, whilst the progesterone from your placenta is still in your body. You deliver your baby, you deliver your placenta, and the progesterone levels drop. And then that's why your milk comes in. So that's why you start to get more really? mature milk, yeah. because the prolactin, the hormone that makes milk, is allowed to work. So we tend to think the days between days three and five that your milk will come in. So it depends very much on your birth, and every mother is slightly different. Um, but somewhere between days three and five, you'll find your milk will be coming in. And what it's doing is it's diluting your colostrum. So there's still colostrum present for a while. Um, it's not that the colostrum disappears, it's just diluted initially by the mature milk. And as you'll see, you know, initially when your milk starts to come in, it's still quite yellow, and yeah. then usually it will get lighter and lighter in colour. Day five or six, it's much, mm. it's almost got a bluey tinge, yeah. hasn't it? and looks much more watery and people think oh it's not very good yes i remember hearing it described milk. as dirty dishwater but no the indifference <laughs> the, the reason it doesn't look the same as cow's milk is that our protein profile is really different yeah. so cow's milk has got more casein which reflects reflects light which makes it look more white whereas we we have less um, and it's absolutely perfect prof, um, profile of protein for our babies because we're growing babies brains and cows are growing muscles and bones so um but thinking about you mixed feeding sarah and um, we would normally suggest that you do feed for the week or so to begin with to get your milk supply going because if you start adding something else in you won't produce that milk supply and you'll find you really you haven't got very much at all so ideally i would go for your first week at least with the breastfeeding and then start to introduce formula um, if you can um, we also know that if you introduce breast milk with formula, that the formula is digested more easily. The components of the breast milk help absolutely. to digest formula, mm. so um, you know it's easier on their tummies. So uh, don't stop giving breast milk if you've got it. You know, and if you're giving a couple of breast feeds a day, um, just think about the little bits of breast milk that you can give. And it might be if you give a bottle and your baby's a bit unsettled, you can put them to the breast and let them have a suckle if you're combining so that they get a bit of breast milk after the bottle and that will help them to digest the formula and it will make uh, make the transition in their gut a little bit easier. Right. But ask answer. questions as you're doing it, you know, um, because mm. you'll do what feels more intuitive to you. And Once you're there, you'll, feel, you'll know when it's right to do it and that will be the right time for you. Um, Leanne's come back and said, thank you, reassuring as always. Brilliant. <laughs> Good luck going back to work and yeah, hope they have a brilliant love it. party. You'll love it. Um, Charlotte has come back, can't believe Alicia's going to, Alicia Jasmine in fact will be two in May, where's that time gone? Just let you know, anyone know that wants to get tickets for the baby and toddler show at Surrey, it's in April, if any new mums or for any new mums and dads. I saw that, I got a message about that, the baby and toddler show. Jada said, hi please, can you tell me how long I can keep breast milk in the fridge? I've been told three different things, five days. Five days is what we always say. And it, I mean, to be honest, that's really been quite conservative, isn't it? Yeah. You know, we tend to say in this trust, and we go with what um, Public Health England recommend, six hours at room temperature, 
five days in the fridge, six months in a deep freeze. So I, I, when I'm reminding staff and students, 656 is how I go, six hours room temperature, five days in the fridge, six months in the freezer. Now, that's still being conservative. We have we have one of our pumps fail and we ended up with a bit of milk where it shouldn't have been. Um, and I kept it for the, aid, for the representative from the company to have a look at, to show him what had happened. And he didn't come for a couple of weeks. And we still poured that milk down the sink. It hadn't gone to yogurt. Um, you know, it was still, you know, it was still there. Okay. It, was, it was still milk, horrible milk. So our five days are still quite conservative, but that's what we tend to recommend is five days. Best practice. Yeah. So hope that helps. And that yeah. should be what you should hear from anyone within this trust because that's what we teach them. And if you freeze it and defrost it, it's slightly different, isn't it? Yeah. So um, once you've defrosted it, it's 12, 12 hours. hours if it's your milk. If it's um, uh, donor breast milk that you've been using, uh, it, it is um, 24 hours, isn't it, yeah. defrosting because it's pasteurised. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and if you've given your bo your baby a bottle of, don of express breast milk, uh, you need to dispose of what you don't use within an hour. You can't keep using that bottle okay. and over and over again. So if your baby's put its mouth on the teat, there's contamination from the baby's oral bacteria. And so best practice is that um, you can't give that milk beyond an hour. Yeah. So uh, particularly as we're going into the warmer weather again, uh, you know, the rooms uh, are much warmer, surroundings are much warmer, it's much more likely to grow bacteria. So um, best practice is that you don't offer your baby food after an hour if you've been giving a, uh, express breast milk in a bottle. It's the same as formula. And Jay, to come back again, thank you. If by the fifth day it's not used, can, it be, can I freeze it? Yes. And you can collect it all in one bottle over a day, so over yeah. a day yeah. and then, you know, it can be in the fridge for five days or you can add to it for five days, but you've got to put it in from the time that you first added it. Mm. So if it's five days before that you added it to that bottle, you've got to then freeze it within that day from the first um, uh, putting, the, uh, putting in the bottle. Right. Sarah's come back and said, thank you for her one. Charlotte's gone, one quick question. What is the best sun cream for Alicia if we want to go on holidays? I want to make sure she doesn't get sunburnt. Um, I have to say, I think you'd need to go and have a look in the shops. Check with the pharmacist. Yeah, just go and see what they recommend. It's usually pretty much a sunblock because um, you don't really 50. want them. Yeah, 50 is what you're looking for. Keep her in the shade. Yeah, but I would go and have a chat with somebody in one of the chemists or you know, boots or somewhere like that. Yeah. Right, well, that's our hour up. Uh, Jay's come back, perfect, thank you. Yeah, don't want to have to throw in milk away, do you? <laughs> no <laughs> way. Small amounts, that's yeah. what we're saying. Put yeah. small amounts in and refill. Put small amounts in. Yeah. Don't put, put 60 mils in a bottle and give 20 because you've got to throw 40 yeah. of it away. Yeah. And that's absolutely soul destroying so strong, when you've worked hard to get it out of your yeah. breast. We know anyway, how hard you work. We're here again next week. Um, um, yep, yeah, so that's going to be a normal week next week. Thank you very much for all your questions. We've done uh, over an hour. so And uh, please tell your friends about it, about Facebook Live. It's amazing. We've, you know, much we've got some of you that are fabulous and come come on week Thank after you. week. Yeah. After week. Um, we're still meeting mums who don't know about it. And it is, we know that it has proved a great resource for quite a lot of people. So do, you know, do and tell them. to be in Oxfordshire. So your yeah. friends from other parts of England can um, watch us. And yeah. other parts of the world as well can watch us. I know we really not do. I know we're not the only trusts that are doing it, but it's, you know, it is, it's quite, it's a great way for us to support you out there and answer those questions that you, you know, you just need a quick yeah. answer to. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it highlights someone who needs a bit more support and then we can do that too. Um, Charlotte's thinking they might go to Spain. Lucky girl. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Okay. Have a lovely Thank week. Thank you very much for all your questions. Bye from us.